Anchor. So I've watched a lot of podcasts. I just started watching Sean Ryan. I feel like it took him a while to really hit his stride. But this is a man who deserves a huge amount of respect. Um, The way that he carries himself, the people that he chooses to interview, the things that he uses his voice to highlight, the fact that he is making his content available for other people to even monetize and upload shows me that he just wants the the messages that that he is trying to get across to reach as many people as possible and if there's anything more altruistic than doing something not just for the money I don't know what it is um, th- this is the type of man that um, that I want to model myself after and if I can If I ever get to a position where I have the reach and the ability, I I would like to use him as a model of my behavior. Let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. You're in the middle of a three-part UFO whistleblower series. This is part two. Today we have DC Long, an army combat veteran who witnessed a hovering monolithic structure in an underground facility on an army base. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you see, please like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go to Spotify and Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, and For those of you that are content creators, we've seen you guys pulling our content off of our episodes, and we really appreciate it. We made it easy on you. There's a link below. It's got hundreds of raw reels that you can take, download for free, make your own content out of it, monetize it, make money. All we ask is you tag the show. Love you all. Enjoy the content. We'll see you soon. DC Long. Sean. Welcome to the show, brother. Pleasure to meet you. So we met also at uh, Dr. Greer's conference in DC with the the Whistleblower Conference. And um, I just want to say it's an honor to have you here. I know it takes a lot of courage to come out and talk about what you're talking about after so long. And um, we're here to get your testimony of what you saw out to the public. What are your goals? It's an honor to be here, first of all. Uh, we spoke earlier downstairs. You know, it can't be pushed further. I mean, it's, you have to give yourself more credit because I wouldn't be alive. I wouldn't be sitting in this chair if it wasn't for you. If it wasn't for the people that you've had on before. I, you know, when I had no strength left, I just happened to come across it. And, uh, you know, the really reason I'm here just as much. So I'm my glad goals you are reflect here. your goals. I'm, I'm glad you are here. And uh, I'm glad the show helped you. It's helped a lot of people. And, and I said it before, I'll say it again. You know, one of the main things we do here is we want to bring hope, especially to vets, you know, overcoming all the trauma that has gone on for the past 20 years. And it will come again, you know, and, and document history, tell truth, expose corruption and again bring hope and you're a perfect example of that hope so thank you for saying that That i appreciate it but now before we get too sentimental here (laughs) i want to give you an uh introduction so dc long you're in the new york uh 
Excuse me, DC Long, you're in the US Army, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 1997 to 2013 was your service medically retired from injuries received from a combat jump. Your father was a government contractor also at Fort Bragg. And you had a encounter with a, what we call monolithic slab hovering off the ground at range 19 at a secret underground bunker. And so we're here to document that testimony. Um, before we get started, everybody gets a gift, <laughs> even you. <laughs> and uh, here you go. Right, thank you. The only thing I brought you was me. That's all right. That's more than enough. <laughs> You're what it's all about. Thank you so much, man. That means a lot. You're welcome. You're welcome. So those are Vigilance League gummy bears. Is it legal? They are legal <laughs> in all 50 states. We actually got an email once. And somebody sent me a, somebody sent us an email and they said, man, I'm on my third bag and I still don't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, dude, you're not supposed to feel anything. They just taste good. But, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. But, um, so we're here to get your eyewitness account on what happened on that day. When was that? When did this happen? That happened in 2011. At the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, when I was still in Fort Bend, Georgia. Were you still active? Yes, I was. Um, and incidentally, it, it had nothing to do with my military career. Anything that I did um, in service had absolutely nothing to do with it in the sense that, uh, as you said, my father was a government contractor. And um, on occasion, I had a 30% stake in the business. So... He would ask me to help him out whenever I could. So I took leave. I came back down uh, to Carolina to help him out. Uh, that day, the day in question, he was in the 18th Airborne Headquarters, G5 War Room. Uh, what he was doing there, I didn't ask. He didn't tell me. But that's where I met him. Uh, he told me that... So some of the lead up to this is kind of slow. But once we get into the uh, floating monoliths, that's when the story starts to really um, pick up. But I think it is important to, to give his background to lend legitimacy to his testimony. Although the Sean Ryan show has this episode po uh, posted, so I, I might actually um, just touch on these two. I might go to Fort Bragg in a minute here, but... Um, I, I don't see him just producing content for entertainment, which is what I see a lot of other people doing on YouTube. Part of the reason that I decided to start my channel is because I saw how successful he was being with truth-telling. Uh, not just entertainment, not bullshit. I mean, entertainment is great too, and, and I want to provide entertainment, but... There's a lot of, uh, of darkness sweeping across America and people that are willing to shine lights on important topics, especially someone who's willing to, to take uh, a business that he's built and use it for that purpose, knowing full well that a lot of these topics aren't taken seriously by most people, are going to delegitimize him. The, the media is going to use some of this content to, to say that he's a he's a wingnut on whatever end of the political spectrum. Um, he he is he's unfiltered. He he uh, probably the realest dude at, at that is on YouTube. I don't know. You you tell me who's more real than than Sean Ryan. If if you know of a guy, I don't. So. We were going to get an escort from JFK Warfare to take us over to a place called Range 19. Uh, is it thundering outside? It is. Right. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you'd set me up. <laughs> but um, where was I? I apologize. You got selected to go to Range 19. Yes, sir. Yeah. They called us. Uh, he called me up, said that we had an escort coming from uh, JFK Warfare to meet us and take us to a place called Range 19. Just real quick, what was your dad's business as a contractor? 
it was turnkey. Uh, originally, it started out doing residential and commercial construction from the monolithic slab to turnkey. Everything was subcontracted in house. So it's whatever you needed, um, as long as you had plans. It was construction. Right. That was that was the main purview. Just Why do you think you guys got selected to do this? So this is the bulk of it. I'm just going to skip. Uh, let's see. It's going to be like three minutes or so. We're going to get into Fort Bragg. The The concept is that he works with his father. Uh, they do building modifications, and one of the locations that they were asked to modify uh, had some pretty sensitive material that he was a witness to. So we're going to go to Fort Bragg. Um, and it didn't continue. have any windows. You couldn't see to the front. It was just a cattle car. And we were joking they were going to take us away, ask him what he did, and we're going to head to Leavenworth for a little while. But uh, we get there, and as soon as the door opened, it, it looked like a literal dump. There was just trash everywhere, not like people just leaving stuff out. It was an actual dump. That was a 45 degree concrete door setting out of one of these hills that was directly in front of us, no further than you and I are to each other now. And uh, so we go inside, meet another escort in there, uh, take us to this freight elevator. We get in there, two series of buttons, didn't have any writing on it. Um, one of the guys looks at my dad and is saying to both of us, yeah, keep your head down, your eyes on the heels of the man in front of you, or you'll be shot. And we kind of started giggling because... You know, at least I knew that one of the guys was one of his buddies, you know, people that he used to hunt out with. And the other guy, I recognized him as the guy who we would went hunting with before. Um, I knew later on that they were uh, both Delta operators. Um, if they were still active, I have no clue. Do you know their names? I do. Do you want to no, say their names? No, absolutely not. Okay. And I'll I'll tell you later why. But yeah, hell, hell no. <clears throat> so you're seeing familiar, fa you're seeing familiar faces, which makes you comfortable, right? And you don't realize how the shit storm I just stepped into. Yeah. yeah, absolutely not. What what exactly were you guys there to do? What he told me was that we were going down below ground to set up a shoot house, uh, okay, an indoor live fire range that was going to be underground. Nothing new. Again, yeah, I, I didn't think anything of it. We had done other uh, shoot houses before with the open tops that can be viewed from above. Mm -hmm. With a catwalk. Uh, yeah. It, so it just, it didn't. Didn't even phase you. It was just another day at work. Okay. And I was just there to help him out. But we get down, uh, the doors open, and uh, the first thing I see are these personnel connexes off to my right, the the smaller ones, not the the large ones uh, that you see scattered around or like the ones you'd see on a, a big rig carrying around, these were the small ones. You would throw your personal gear in to go before you get shipped overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I, I looked past them, I could see this giant monolithic slab just sitting there. Um, at first, it didn't, you know, once again, it, it didn't, set off any alarms i didn't think much of it but the closer we got to it i could feel this intense vibration that but uh, you couldn't hear anything it was dead silent in there uh, the the loudest thing was the the footsteps that i could hear and uh what, what did the vibration feel like it felt like being at a concert standing next to one of the speakers and without the bass the noise. just permeating through your body without the noise there was zero noise Zero, vibration. absolute zero. I could still hear myself breathing over this, but inside, I have such a strange feeling to have. So the closer I got, and I was like, well, I got to check this out. So I go down to one knee, you know, that fact, and I got to... So this vibration thing really resonates with me because I saw something in the sky that moved way too fast, and then clouds moved in. It was me and another person. We both saw this. Um, I questioned them about it and they, they described exactly what I'd seen. And I was like, okay, so that wasn't just a, it wasn't my imagination. And then 
30 minutes later, clouds had moved in and some sort of, it sounded to me like a, an electrical transformer, but it was more of like a hum that you could feel. It wasn't just auditory. I asked the other person, I was like, can you tell which direction that's coming from? And they said, it feels like it's coming from all directions. We turned off all the music. I walked around. There's a transformer in the backyard up on a telephone pole. It was not coming from there. It sounded like it was coming from there, but it also sounded like it was coming from the front of the house, the neighbor's house, the other neighbor's house. It, it was everywhere. And uh, in hindsight, after seeing that and then experiencing this resonant hum, I've, this is now multiple people that I've heard describe this, and I'm I'm really starting to believe that uh, I I believe that there's some maybe anti gravity drive ships out there, but there also may be these ships that also operate on acoustic or resonance, um, because you can levi levitate things with with acoustics. I I feel free to look up. Um, acoustics and water you can pour a stream of water and using a speaker you can shape that water you can shape sand um, and obviously the way you shake sand is the sound lifts it and then it falls in a certain pattern and there's YouTube channels that are dedicated to showing I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's being used as technology right now it's being used as entertainment but the fact that those forces exist and it is possible to manipulate material with sound. Um, there's even people that believe that there's sound-based healing. Um, there's mental effects from listening to certain frequencies. Um, and in addition, all matter is vibrational energy. So the air in your tires, the higher the PSI, the faster those molecules, the air molecules inside your tire are vibrating. That's what creates the pressure. A slab of granite same thing there is vibration in those molecules the universe is vibration so the idea that you could manipulate objects and and do a whole bunch of crazy stuff makes total sense because everything has its own frequency vibration all these things uh, with our limited understanding we understand enough to, to, to at least conceptualize how this could work at a time my boots and then I glance up underneath it and there's absolutely nothing underneath this damn thing. Nothing holding it up whatsoever. What did the slab look like? It just looked like a, a granite slab, but the sheen on it is is what caught my attention the most. It was kind of in between being polished or just completely translucent. There was something behind it but you could tell it had a smooth surface to us. And the only lights that were on in that hangar that we were in were directly over our head where we were walking through that walkway. And how big was the slab? Oh God, it was about 20 foot long. It was about seven foot tall and I couldn't tell how wide it was by that point I was already. So I'm trying not to, I, I am going to speculate but I, I'm also going to preface this and say I don't fucking know. You know, this is just guessing. But you've got these artifacts that have been described by many, many people that human beings have had over the course of history. Something like the Ark of the Covenant, which makes an army undefeatable. Um, you know, I remember the controversy over the pyramids when I was... I'm 38, so I remember my whole lifetime the pyramids have been discussed. And just the progress that we've made from 1999... When I was like 13 years old, I'm now 38, and uh, the progress technologically that we've made and, the, and our inability still to explain how people with bronze tools were able to form these stones and cut out megalithic size stones that, that it would take multiple modern cranes to lift into place, and they're, they're doing this with such precision that it does beg the question, how come we can't explain this still? And uh, so, you know, with the Ark of the Covenants, it, it, those type of artifacts, could that be recovered alien technology from way, way long ago? You know, uh, maybe a ship crashes and some dynasty recovers this and uses it as part of their empire's power. Um, maybe the pyramids were built with something like that and then housed something like that. 
I don't believe that they were tombs. They've got complex structures. A lot of people have speculated that they seem like they might be able to produce energy or something like that. Um, there's acoustics and, and things that you can observe with the construction of those chambers on the inside. Uh, there's venting. There's it's Again, I don't know, but I'm just saying, since we can't explain it, and then he's talking about a black toolbox creating a vibration that levitates this stone, the concept of there being some sort of otherworldly technology that some human being got their hands on and decided to build these structures seems entirely pl plausible. I just don't know any of the details and neither does anyone else at this point. However, if this tech is real, if disclosure is real, if the whistleblower laws get passed and all this stuff really does come out and the tech is being held by some of these corporations, Raytheon and Lockheed, first question is, are they going to give it up? If you've got godlike power, even the U.S. government with all their military might can't do shit. And if they're not already hiding this stuff and moving it, I don't know what they're doing. So I, I don't have a lot of hope that even if this stuff is true, that we're we're going to be able to see these these objects because these corporations have so many resources. I mean, they're almost beyond government control in some cases. You've got the illusion of government regulation. But the reality is that th these corporations, these defense contractors, the U.S. military is fully dependent on them. Um, they don't need the U.S. military as much as the military needs them, if that makes sense. Uh, especially in the situation where they fully control, own, and operate this, this caliber and level of technology. Um, and one of the previous, the previous podcasts to this one... The gentleman who was on was saying that these craft are being used in human abductions in disaster areas. And him and his uh, squad of Marines, I think he was on the ground with six Marines, as part of guarding a Hilo landing zone in Indonesia after the tidal wave, they spotted an object and investigated. And were they were greeted, according to his testimony, by... Um, two teams of four who approached with covering fields of fire from a 45 degree diagonal indicating that they were very very precise they understood how to not put themselves in a situation where they both teams would not be able to fully engage the enemy um, they had technology that was not something that that he was familiar with you know he's in the military at the time so they had very advanced handheld smartphone type like devices that they scan their IDs with. Uh, meanwhile, this craft is in the background, metallic. It's got ramps down at some point. Up armored 350s, blacked out, drove up with containers in the bed. When he was testifying in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee, one of the other people there said, I'm not going to let this guy, I'm not going to leave him hanging out to dry and said that um, he was speculating that there were drugs in these containers and humans were using these ships to get away with smuggling drugs globally. Uh, but that person claimed that there were people, humans, in those containers. Uh, and it just makes sense, right? If, you, if human beings have godlike powers, these people who want power and money so badly, mo the most corrupt people rise into those positions because it's all they want. They want money and control. So if you give someone who wants money and control something that's just absolutely ridiculously powerful, it doesn't shock me at all that they would use it for the, the most despicable acts that a human being can, can commit. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that they would use that type of control and power to disenfranchise other people from their basic rights uh, in, in order to, to increase their power and and self-aggrandize themselves even beyond what they already do pretty directly in front of it so there's like absolutely it would be impossible for a human to even think about picking something like this up oh there's no way okay even with the construction that we've done if you had to pick up something like that to move it anywhere you would need at least three four cranes oh wow Herrera could tell you better okay you know, the the scope of equipment that it would take just to get it off the ground you know, not even to transport it to a, 
uh, another location. But uh, at this point, I'm still down on my knee and I'm looking and behind it, I can see two people standing. The only thing I can see is their feet, but there, there's this boulder directly behind it and it's on the ground. And I glance over my shoulder and there's a guy with his back turned to me standing in front of another boulder identical of the other one that I could see up underneath the monolithic slab. And he's just pushing it with one hand. And then I assume he's pushing it in the other direction because it's just freely spinning, no wobble. It's like it was attached to the top and the bottom and it was paper mache. That's how easily this guy was just spinning it around. Wow. Now at this point, um, the escort behind me kicks me in the back says let's go now I was talking to my buddy about this and he was talking about electromagnet electromagnetic effects but I mean everybody's dealt with normal magnets they're very short range you know you pull them out just a little bit away from metal object there's no force whatsoever magnetism is a very short range effect uh, not only that these are stone from what he could tell um and even electromagnets like the ones on cranes, um, you have to bring that down almost to the point of contact with the car. It's not like the, the car is like, you know, five feet below the thing and it just sucks the, the car up. It's it Even the most powerful magnets are fairly short range. And, and he's describing... Also, if you've seen those magnetic pens, they had to create a circular magnet. Because a magnet underneath is just going to make it fall one way or the other. So those those the pe the pens that you can stick in the magnetic holder and it just levitates on your desk, that's a circular magnet that's containing and providing equal force from all directions in order to keep the pen upright and stabilized. So magnetism to me in no way could explain what he's describing, especially the fact that they're able to move these and touch them and not affect their you know, ability to stay off the ground. So we get up, keep going, go down uh, a flight of stairs. That's when we get to what we call the shoot house. Um, you could see old lanes where they had actually used it before as a live fire range underground. And uh, we'd probably only been down there 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes maybe. Father was taking notes on the dimensions, what we needed, what I guess he understood what they wanted. Um, and I know that we had to replace the walls. It's inconsequential to the story, but we had to replace the rubber on the walls for the uh, shoot house. And in that amount of time, we go back upstairs, exact same route that we took on the way down, and everything's empty when we get to the hangar again everything the two boulders in the back the monolithic slab all of it is absolutely gone and it was we weren't you know 100 yards below these guys we were just one flight below them so whatever it was they were taking out we would have heard it, it you, even the uh, the people making noise around it you would have still been able to hear but it was dead silent like i said uh, before there was nothing in there just our feet, but coming back through, it was absolutely gone. Everything in there just vacated. And at, at that point, it's how much time had passed? Less than 30 minutes. Less than 30 minutes. Because it, it didn't take us long to do what we had to do downstairs. And, and this was just an assessment. You guys weren't actually. You weren't any. You weren't doing any construction or repairing the walls. None or anything. It was just a hey, it this was is just... what we need to do. So there was no equipment that you were operating that would have that would have muffled any sound that was going on above the right. Take the measurements, layouts. You. The loudest thing was the you know the tape measure we were using. You now uh, that a roll tape and a notebook. That was it. That was the only thing that um, that was the only thing we had down there. I don't know if I've is tensions continue to escalate in our country. Slab, did you feel the vibration? Did you feel it before you saw it? So he's going to go into the fact that his father um, has some pretty s s 
died as a result very shortly after this. I'm going to pull up some information on that while we're watching this, but listen to his testimony, but also understand that he had an assassination attempt on his life and his father was killed. So all the stuff that he's saying is corroborated by real world ramifications, harm to his family, and some other really weird stuff. So, you know, dirt, this show reached the number one podcast spot because he's willing to talk about this stuff before it's completely verified, because he was part of this community, because he has a high level of respect for people that come from that community, especially if they're if they are honorably retired, um, they've got nothing to nothing to gain and everything to lose unless they are being patriotic and they want the truth out there because there are people who are who have this technology and are using it for evil. If this is the case, then I think that the risk he's taking by putting things out there that, that are somewhat speculative um, is worth it. Um, a lot of people are scared and want to just stick with, uh, they want to stay in their lane and they want to stick with stuff that they can prove. I think it takes bravery and, and confidence and belief in what you're doing to stick your neck out in any manner uh, with anything you're doing. People who are willing to, to be the first to talk about things or to lead the way, um, just incredible. No, no. Whenever we, that, uh, when the, the doors of the freight elevator open and I looked down, I could see it. Okay. I could, yeah, I mean, it was no farther than you know, from here to that camera pod. I mean, six seven feet away from me whenever we were walking in but oh, what made that, me stop it was that close right what made me stop was as close as we got i noticed that in front of me with my dad and the other escort in front of him it was almost like hopping a trip wire you know when you're on the trail you just get it and go and that was the first thing i noticed and then the closer i got to it that intense vibration and i was just too curious yeah I, I couldn't stand it i had to figure out what it was and um i really shouldn't have when did the vibration stop it didn't stop until i walked away okay in the center at looking at the top of it you could see this black box um i've tried to describe it before and it was extremely difficult it just looked like a, a small black gmtk toolbox that a military mechanic would have or carry around. It wasn't very big and it just had two leads that came off of it. And it looked like it was wrapped in a casing that you could almost see something inside of it, but it wasn't mechanical. It wasn't moving. It didn't have lights. It was just opaque, but it didn't really seem to serve any purpose, but that the other boulder had the same thing on top of it. But so are you, hold said, on, I'm sorry. Are you no. saying you saw two boulders and a slab? Yeah. And they were and all three of them at the same time? The the slab itself, the monolithic slab, it was about 12 to 15 inches off the ground. Okay. And whenever I knelt down to tie my, tie my shoes, I could look through it and I saw the first boulder that I noticed and it was just sitting on the ground. Okay. And then I'll glance back. Whoever wrote this is an idiot. It's not a con ax, it's a con X. This is not correct. Obviously no familiarity with containers or the military. And the, that's when I saw the other boulder that had the same black box on top that was being moved around. And that was that was levitating. Yes. So one boulder was levitating, totally one slab levitating, one boulder on the ground. Correct. Okay. Did the, did the slab have a black box anywhere near it? The monolithic slab? Yeah. It did. It did? Where yeah. was that located? It was on the top near the center where I was feeling most of the vibration. It was like the closer I got to it, that's where it was the most intense, at the, at the center of the slab, where that box was on top of it. Okay. Keep going. And after that, um, we go back upstairs the way we came, like I said. We get out of the door to leave. 
fans still in the same place. We hop back in. We take that same 15-minute drive back to uh, 18th Airborne headquarters. Uh, they gave us our phone back. I got my ID. And then my dad said something to one of the other guys that uh, I recognized that he knew that I didn't I didn't know his name. But um, that guy took everything that my dad had, you know, minus his phones. Uh, he, he took the notes, he took the tapes, everything uh, from him there. And, and uh, I didn't think much of it at that point. I didn't know if that was something he was going to submit to the Army Corps of Engineer rep that he had, whoever was going to coordinate, you know, or give him the go ahead to submit a bid to do this project. You know, so to me, again, that didn't set off any bells. Um, we're getting ready to leave. Uh, as I said, uh, let me back that up. Before we go and get our phones and our identifications, um, the second guy that I recognized, the one that I, I do know, he was upstairs in the G5 war room in the 18th HHC. And it's just him sitting at the desk as soon as you go into the vault. And he's got two pieces of paper. And he's like, I need you to sign this. And it was a non uh, an NDA. And I was like, fuck that. I'm not going to sign that. Come on, man. Really? It's like, you know me. I don't give a shit. And uh, my dad just kind of played it off to the same thing. He's like, man, I'm not signing that shit. So that's whenever we leave. At that point, I'm getting ready to go back to Georgia. Uh, this is roughly 24 hours later. I get a phone call. It was one of my dad's employees. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? I was no, nah, not much. Just headed back to work. He said, well, we can't get to work. So what do you mean? He's like, well, everything, they called it the barn where we had all of our equipment stationed, where they would meet before they would go to, to uh, Fort Bragg. He said, the barn's locked up and everything's gone. This is the same day? No, this is 24 hours later. Okay. Whenever I'm getting ready to go back home. And um, I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, everything's gone. So I try to call my dad. I can't get up with him. I was like, just stand fast. I'm coming down there. So I get down there, and like you said, the barn's locked up. Everything down there that I could see, I mean, you could still go there to this day. You could see our staging area and how big it was and all the equipment that we had there. It's absolutely barren. There's nothing there. It's all gone. And my dad at the time lived just around the corner from there. I go up there to his house, and the door is kicked in. And like the video I showed you earlier, downstairs, uh, I did that to illustrate how close me and my father were. Because just telling the story from this point on, it, it, it sounds inconsequential. But like, oh, well, sons and fathers have problems all the time. It's no big deal for bad blood to, you know, to take over. And just people could be too much like each other, bullheaded, and not be able to communicate. And that's why I showed you that so you, you could see what kind of I mean I've called the damn guy my hero because yeah. he was uh, but uh, I get in there and my dad's sitting at his couch and his office is just to the left of his living room and everything is torn out everything is gone and I was like what's going on man he's like it's all gone I was like do you think this has something to do with range 19 and he stood up that man you saw, and he said, don't you ever fucking mention that name to me again. And that was the last time that I got to spend any time face-to-face -face with my daddy. Yeah, but... I'm sorry. It's, uh... Uh, a life, a business, everything that we built together. And I, I got, I mean, he says it, I don't need to say it, but what, what would it take if you have a child and your father or mother, what would it take for you to cut off contact with them? I think that the only answer that makes sense to that question is if you were told that the only way 
that they would not come to harm is that you cut off contact and if you were told that if we catch you talking whatever about this or or following up in any way you're both you're both done uh, I think that's the only thing that makes sense as far as the answer to that question um, and it also lines up with what I believe that the the government would do or or if it's corporate I mean supposedly the corporate um, the corporations are the ones that hold this tech supposedly so I don't know if they're they're the ones that are occupying this government facility I don't know how any of this works but um, it makes sense that 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 would be their their lever that they would pull to try to make someone do what they want and no answers I had no excuses no reasons no answers whatsoever just unreturned phone calls the few times I ever did get a chance to speak to him it was only my voice being heard he'd just hang up on me he'd hang up on you yeah yeah I didn't my god it wasn't until 2021 that I, I got to see him again. I didn't get to. He would just refuse to see you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it made me wonder what what could somebody threaten you with to make you turn your back on your own child? I don't know how many children you have. But I killed for my country. What in the hell do you think I would do for my babies? And I'm his only son. I'm his legacy. Every loan from the beginning of the time to me is if it stops with me, then that's where it stops. But he gave me that. To us, that was important. And, you know, I cut my ties. I, I just, I let it I let it go where it, it's so hard to talk about, man. But in, uh, let's get back to, to my part of the, that affects my career and why I was retired. It was, uh, mm. is your dad still alive? No, he's not. When did he pass? November 10th, 2021. How? Well, that's, um, they said that he had aggressive cancer that they found late that, um, he was just ravaged. It was all over. And, um, <laughs> I know shit happens as I'm no stranger to that with our careers and all, all the guys in this room, none of us are strangers to, to things happening. We have a better way of accepting it than most people do, I think. But not him, not like that. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't, I don't get into that part of life. It's just, even some of it to me that I'm aware of, irrefutably makes me feel like it's just absolutely insane but I will never believe that my father died of cancer or natural causes. A man is as big and as powerful as him, not because he couldn't have been taken. We're all measured. It was just, he was healthy. And then in two months, he went from being 240 pounds to 105. Wow. Just, I mean, when I, they, that sounds like symptoms of radiation poisoning, which, uh, Pull up some information, but the Russians did this to um, someone in England who betrayed Mother Russia and Putin. Called me and told me that he was in the hospital, and I went to go see him. I walked by his room twice. I did, I just honestly, the first thought that, that crossed my mind is that man, I, I feel bad for that guy. That sucks. And then when they told me that's who it was, you know, I went in and he still couldn't even look at me. 
and I don't know why. And I just, you now I, I took his hand. I said, look, man, I don't even know if you can talk. He had the chemo scars or some look like I assume were chemo burns on his mouth. It was just these gnarly burns on his face and his eyes were just cracked with jaundice. And I was like, man, we're square. I don't care what happened. I love you. And a tear went down his cheek and I was asked to leave. Uh, he started to code and that was the last time I saw him. You know, it's shortly after um, the incident, it was in uh, late 2011, early 2012. I'm, uh, I've already been JMPI kitted out for a combat jump. Got the full pack, got the 1950s weapons case dangling. And uh, I was the first man in the stick. They gave us, you know, told us the, the 30 second sign. We're all hooked up and ready to go. The jump master's got his arm up, getting ready to hit me in the back. And then we see shuffling. And I'm only one of 12 guys that I jump with every time. Uh, it never deviated, no change. That was my team. It didn't matter if it was Conus, Oconus. Those were my guys, only 12. <clears throat> and a guy from the back shuffles his way to the front, and it's one of the escorts. He is unmistakable. You can't. I mean, really? You, you know. Yeah. And at first, it didn't, it just didn't connect with me. It, it just, you know, I just gave him a, hey, how you doing? And he just winked at me. As soon as that uh, John Master's arm came up, and the green light's getting ready to go off. No sooner than it hit, and I felt his arm coming down, I feel something slap me on the side of the face, and it was a static line. And that man took off out of the aircraft. So I don't mean to distract from what he's talking about, but this is what I'm talking about when I've mentioned on the channel. People explaining the same phenomenon through different prisms of understanding. So one person who experiences what's described right here would say poltergeist, ghost spirit someone who believes in aliens visitation um entities uh you know if you believe in in god and hell you could say demons um but the, the fact that people of different backgrounds describe these same sort of experiences i think lends credence to the underlying phenomenon but the confusion is probably how we're trying to explain these things. So. And when he did, it snapped my neck. And it pulled me out upside down, deployed my combat gear. Long story short, at a complete oscillation. And I just smacked the ground and I woke up a month later. Career's over. And I'll tell you something else. It's Do you mean you burned in? Yeah. Your shoe didn't. Well, my shoot, what happened? my shoot deployed, but whenever I fell out of the aircraft and I think maybe we were jumping from 800 feet, if I had to guess, that's what it looked like from the, the, the horizon. But whenever he hit me going out of the aircraft and the static line went taut and it snapped my neck and I fell out of the craft, I'm not even sure how I fell out, but it deployed my lower end line on the way out. So whenever my canopy did open, it just started a complete oscillation. Okay. I remember looking down and seeing daylight and just smack, and it was over. You think that was an assassination attempt? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was. And the only reason I tell you that is because when my father died, not even a week after I buried that man, I'm at my, our new house at the beach. Nobody knew I'd been there. I hadn't even changed my driver's license over. I hadn't even told the VA that's where I'm living. Not even a week after that man was buried, I get a knock at the door. It's that same guy who cut me out of the door, hands me a note that said, thinking of you, he's like, hey, sorry about your loss, buddy. 
what would you do? And Dr. Greer asked me, he said, well, did you feel like they were trying to intimidate you or they're trying to hurt you? Absolutely not. If that was the case, I would have never seen it coming. To me, it just felt like somebody looking you dead in the eye and said, I can touch you anytime I want. And then it, everything started flooding back, and that's what led us to here. I wrote out that entire story to Dr. Greer. You you fell out, and it, I'm, it was a week after you buried your old man, you said? Or the day after? I'm sorry. Whenever he showed up? Yes. That was a week after I okay. buried my father. At Rudy Marist Cemetery in Dublin, North Carolina. Nobody knew I was there. Nobody. So this is rec this is 2021. Yes, just a couple of years ago. Yes. And you still and this happened. When was the accident? When was well? When was the assassination attempt? 2011, 2012. Did you it's recognize honestly, him? I've got it written down everywhere. It's so hard to remember. That's when I got this. Yeah. And ever since then, it's just been fuzzy. And that's what led us to this. That that scared me so damn bad that I had decided I wasn't suicidal. No, please don't get me wrong. I was not depressed. I wasn't. I just felt like at that point that it's not about me. I've got my children. If something happens to them, it's my fault. So I figured if I quietly recuse myself, Who's going to know better? What's it going to matter? My story's over. Get to see my dad again. And hopefully save my kids from this bullshit. Because it, everything changes. I don't know. I like to think that I got a pretty good bullshit meter. You can't bullshit a bullshitter. And I love bullshitting. But uh, nothing about this strikes me as any manner of bullshit. So, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think a lot, I, I don't think a lot of people have seen this episode. I don't think an, enough people have seen this episode. So I, I hope that I can provide even more exposure, um, than the people that have already got this posted up. It's, it's one thing when you lose your brothers, it's one thing when you lose your family, but if you, Worried about losing your children, that's that's taking it to a whole nother level. Yeah. You know, just because we choose to be peaceful at this point in our lives does not mean that we forgot how to be violent. I'll take the whole damn world down to protect those kids. And I know you would do the same for yours. Yeah. But what stopped me was you. Are you in contact with your mom? Is she alive? She's alive. Was she still married to your dad when he passed? No. Was she still married to your dad in 2011 when this happened? When the when you witnessed the monolithic slab? No. No. No contact. No. And unfortunately, I I remind her a lot of my father. And it's nothing against her. We still have a great rapport. I mean, I'm I'm 43 years old with everything I've been through. I still blow my mom a kiss whenever I leave her. It's not like, you know, we did the same thing my dad did. It's just I know <clears throat> how painful it was for her to lose him. And hearing me speak, you know, we have the same eyes. Do you guys I, ever I, talk about this? No, no. Was there any communication from your dad to your mother that you're aware of. The only way she's going to know about any of this is by watching the podcast. Okay. All right. But, you know, and that's, I'm, I'm ashamed, absolutely ashamed from being too afraid to keep going. You know, that's, I didn't even bring up the homeless bit because I did it to myself. It wasn't some crazy circumstance that I could blame on anybody else. It was my fault because I was afraid. So this destroyed your life. You damn right it did. I'm still I'm still trying to rebuild. You know, but I don't I don't ask anybody for anything. I don't it's not about that to me. You know, it's 
I lost all familial contact whenever I lost him in that sense. I mean, the, the war is bad enough watching your brothers go through what you feel like you should have went through. You know, I can't speak for everybody, but survivor's guilt tears me up every day. Now, if there's one thing I hate myself for, isn't not trying. It's just not giving enough. Uh, I can't. The, the names I say at night when I go to sleep, the men that I think about, I just, I miss them so damn bad because those guys, I knew that they would die for me. Some of them did. And the one safety net that I had here was him. When you went to, it was just you and your old man that went to range 19 that day? Or were there any other, did you guys have any workers with you? No. Just you and your dad? Just he and I. What do you, why are you coming forward? Why did, why are you coming forward to, to, to to educate the public about what you saw that day. Same thing I said at the press conference. I'm damn tired of doing nothing. You know, I can take losing my career. I'm fine with that. I didn't think I was going to do it forever. I'm fine with losing material possessions, but one thing I will not stand for to watch people in this country just hand their freedoms over and think that the government's doing them a favor watching my brothers who would rather be homeless than have to deal with the bullshit that got us there in the first place. And it's not because we're afraid. It's because we don't feel like we did enough. We feel like we're just putting our burden on other people. And that's something that they don't deserve. You're willing to die for people who don't even damn like you. To me, that's absolutely fucking insane. But that's just the kind of people that we are. And it wasn't until I heard something that Herrera said, our oath didn't expire. Good damn luck taking this shit off my neck. Right now, somewhere, there's a little kid sitting somewhere across this world, and he's got his grandpa's combat boots, and one day he's going to be old enough to fit in them. And if we sit back and do nothing, if we do not do, lead by example... They're going to think that it's okay just to be quiet. I think for too damn long, good Americans, it doesn't matter if you're a combat vet to me. It doesn't matter if you didn't shed the same blood that I did. What matters the most to me is good people who believe in the flag. That one sitting over there that so many people died for, the one that was flying over ground zero, the sacrifice, whether it was a false flag or not, that flag is important to me. And I'd be damned if whatever life I've got left, I'm going to sit there and be quiet about it because there's a big fight. And if we do nothing, the bad boys are going to prevail. They're going to take over. And I don't think we want that. This world could be so much easier if they would just let it out. But somebody wants to make money off of it. Well, I commend you for your courage, man. That means a ton to everybody that's listening. And um, I know what that takes. And I just, I want to say, man, I'm, I'm sorry about your old man. I'm really sorry to hear about that. And, and um, yeah, but he'd be damn glad that you wouldn't let me go all the way. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> glad you're here, buddy. Okay, well, that's a lot to unpack. Um, I would say, you know, it was his experience was a pretty small, singular event, but the fallout has had permanent and lasting effects on his life uh, and his family. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I hope that um, it opened your eyes to, you know, what might be... Um, under government or corporate control and I hope that that possibly we can come together for a change and exert some pressure to to make sure that this information and technology potentially comes out because if, if this stuff is real and it exists we're still using fossil fuels we're still using 
conventional. We're still using Stone Age technology compared to this stuff that could, you know, democratize the world and reduce need and consumption and pollution. Uh, it's not about money. Life is not about money. And the evil fucking pieces of shit that that perpetuate that that being the the guiding principle of the system there's only a few of them and there's hundreds of millions of us in in the United States and there's billions of us worldwide um their only safety is keeping us confused divided uninformed unorganized the only organization they want is the organization that they give us. The only goals and and uh, principles that they want us to have are the ones that they tell us that we should have. That needs to change because their moral compass is fucked. Their goals are fucked. Their goals are not to make our lives better. Their goals are just money, 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 power, 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 control, control, control. The goal should be to make the world a better place than when you arrived and any sort of decent man or woman should feel that deep in their bones and I hope that you do you guys take care I'll be back with more soon I'm not suicidal I would never kill myself